106.3 FM and 1240 AM. The Brew for the best classic hits of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. KOKL, Okmulgee, Oklahoma. SJ, welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. Yes, to let's see if we can get this silly thing to work. Yes, Jay and Gary Five Joe Diff get us. Good morning. Welcome to our program again. We are continuing our focus on um, on health issues that affect our people, and uh, today we'll uh, be speaking with uh, with Andy Peters, who is the um, let's see, Ms. Peter, what is it, Director of Infectious Diseases and Employee health. Yeah. health, okay. All right, let's try that one again. All right, now we have also Dr. Vark on, on let's see, on the phone, on phone line here. Dr. Vark, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. Okay, well, we want to thank you all for coming in. I know it's a busy time of the year as we're getting ready for uh, colder weather and this sort of thing. Uh, we have heard uh, a lot in the, in the news uh, in recent times about uh, uh, the COVID-19 is still with us and there are variants that have, ha- have developed. Uh, um, Ms. Peters, how long has this disease, this, this virus been with us now? Well, we are going on, I believe, two and a half years of, of COVID-19. So... The Department of Health, uh, we continue to monitor our levels in our community. So this past week, we were at 19% positivity in in the Creek Nation area. Uh, we monitor these uh, tests on a daily basis and see how our levels are in each of the areas. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about ballpark figure about 15,000 there something like that or more yes well, math is terrible that. that's why I became a journalist uh, Dr. Vark now you're kind of uh, the boots on the uh, on the ground uh, end of the business here uh, what has your your uh, unit seen now uh, how uh, are we being affected well it's uh, kind of a mixed bag Gary we uh We have been seeing some uh, increased numbers of people that are infected with COVID-19. As Andy has said from our our numbers, 19% is is fairly significant. The good thing about these variants is uh, they do not appear to cause a lot of severe illness, and certainly the death rates are much lower than they were. Uh, The other side of the coin if you will is that these variants uh, they call them ba4 and ba5 which is irrelevant for most folks but in case you hear it uh, they are extremely contagious so uh, you know even even very slight exposure to these variants uh, is likely to cause some type of disease now perhaps we could take a Uh, a minute or two and and describe uh, what we're talking about you said uh, it doesn't take much exposure to to be affected infected Uh, what are we talking about there shaking hands or hugging somebody or you know kissing a baby what what we what do we got there well it's a it's an airborne disease Uh, so really uh, even even contact you don't have to even have personal contact. If you are within three to six feet of a person for probably 15 minutes and no one is masked, uh, your risk of contracting COVID, if you've not been vaccinated in particular, are are fairly high. Probably, 
I would say along the range of 40%. So, uh, you know, obviously if you have been vaccinated, that does provide you some protection. Uh, I'm probably jumping ahead here, but the, the new booster shots that are available now are specifically designed um, to focus on these new variants and provide protection there so uh and we do have some medication now that is uh effective for COVID-19 taking you take it by uh it's a pill form so we do have some resources from which to fight this thing uh but uh it doesn't doesn't require personal touch contact it's airborne mm -hmm. and that's what makes it so contagious uh miss peters is there anything there that uh you well, want to focus on or perhaps add? Yes, just to reiterate what Dr. Vark said, <clears throat> especially in uh, crowded areas, groups, that's where a lot of the transmission can occur. Uh, when you get a lot of people in an area, uh, everyone breathing um, the air, that, that is a source of transmission. Also, you know, just touching inanimate objects like, um, you know, anything that a, that a person who is infected has touched. Like a doorknob. A doorknob, anything um, that, a, a bathroom, in a bathroom, and then that person touches one of their uh, areas of, of transmission, like their eyes, their nose, their mouth that that can lead to that person becoming infected and it is a highly transmissible variant so in the department of health we continue um, our mitigation uh, strategies which include wearing masks uh, good hand hygiene the cleaning and disinfecting of surfaces so we're continuously monitoring those areas I know people are, are tired of this, uh, we're tired of it, um, however, uh, this, this particular um, virus is, is here and it's probably going to stay, so we have to learn how to, how to live with it and uh, protect ourselves. Yeah, I know we've, uh, we're all fatigued from it and I imagine yes. your staff is really worn out. But, yes. Um, if we're talking about uh, someone becoming infected here, what sorts of uh, symptoms? What? How, how are they going to react or get or just get sick? I mean, uh, let me hear from both of you, actually. A lot of the uh, patients or employees will call, and <clears throat> they, they give the symptoms of allergy-type symptoms, you know, the cough, the runny nose, they just think that they have allergies. We'll go ahead and give them a test and they're positive. So it, it mimics a lot of the other viruses or allergies as far as symptoms. Um, however, some of the symptoms can become um, severe in, in patients or employees who uh, maybe have an immunocompromised system so we have to really watch and monitor those symptoms um dr vark something to uh, to add on that well i think i need a good job uh, i would say that uh, they do a lot of people do start out presenting as allergy cases but uh covid is um a little bit interesting is in that as you progress through phases of the disease like day three and day four those symptoms can increase quite a bit and it people turn they start with allergy like symptoms and then frequently they wind up with pretty good flu like symptoms so hard coughing low grade fever uh, body aches just generally feeling pretty loud so that's uh, that's one of the reasons why we uh it's you know it's more than allergies uh Having been so unfortunate as to get COVID in June, uh, I could personally attest to the fact that uh, it started out as allergies, but it didn't wind up that way. Ouch. Um, my next question here is, uh, I guess, a bit morbid. Uh, 
if you uh, are affected, if it does, you know, end up hit, hitting 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 your cell phone, uh, what are the chances of a, of, of a fatality? I mean, is this, some people have panicked and said it's an automatic death sentence, and others say no, it's just mild cold, and you know. What are the, what's the danger there? I mean, are we talking a lot of people not not recovering to to die because of. It? Well, I think it it depends on you know the the particular individual what what they have as far as a health history you know what what um, maybe if if they are immunosuppressed. It just depends on the particular individual. We do have treatments now that that these patients can take. So uh, we need to get those patients identified pretty quickly as far as testing positive and then offering those options for like the, the medications Dr. Vark mentioned uh, by mouth. Now, Dr. Vark, have you seen uh, much in the way of uh, people not recovering and, and passing on because of this? Uh, fortunately, Gary, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the uh, rates of death with this particular, these particular variants is uh, is not nearly what it was back in the uh, the surge of the uh, Delta variant, where you know hospitals were overloaded, ICUs were at capacity. In fact, uh, you know uh, we had to uh, make a makeshift ICU out of the emergency room. Uh, in Okmulgee at that particular time. It's, we're not dealing with a situation like that. Uh, but if you have uh, chronic lung disease, if you have chronic heart disease, if you have diabetes, if you are significantly overweight, um, those are all risk factors for uh, going on and progressing to a bit more severe form of the illness. So people with uh, with with underlying health conditions are the people that need to be a little bit more careful. And, uh, and we certainly, uh, you know, we uh, promote uh, the boosters, absolutely. We promote the primary vaccination. Those have been the things that have really seemed to stem the tide as far as uh, ICU admissions and death. So. Another question on, on the variants. Um, have we seen... Uh, a, a strain of this virus that just is untreatable, that's like not able to uh, be defeated, so to speak. I mean, is there is there one of them out there or pretty much all of them uh, can be dealt with with some form of, uh, of treatment? Well, so far, the Omicron, <coughs> uh, Dr. Bark mentioned, it is, um, it continues to mutate. The, the dominant variant in Oklahoma is the B4, B5. Um, this new um, vaccine booster that's out has, per se, uh, particles of, the, of that Omicron in it, so it can help build antibodies to, to that variant. So as far as it not being uh, able to be treated, uh, we don't have that you know, information, but we do have the vaccines that that will help build your immune system to that. Okay, uh, uh, your thoughts on that, Dr. Vark? Is there one out there that we just can't beat? Uh, no, Gary, not right at the current time. I mean, obviously, when COVID first raised its ugly head, uh, you know, we didn't have any idea what we were dealing with. And at that point, uh, we had no specific treatment just to try and uh, keep patients comfortable, uh, prevent uh, bacterial infections like pneumonia from setting in, and, uh, and help their own immune system fight the disease. I will say, however, not to be doom and gloom, but when you have a virus that continually mutates, you, you don't know what the future will hold. So although, uh, although we have not come across a variant at this point in time that has defeated all of our uh, our arsenal, I guess, of vaccines and uh, infusions and oral medications. 
uh, we have to be very vigilant because uh, viruses mutate and they can mutate to a point where those type of treatments could theoretically be, uh, be greatly decreased or ineffective. Hmm. Um, I'm going to ask you two to respond to a question here that's uh, probably help us with some rumor control. Uh, there are, of course, some folks who are very strongly uh, strong believers in that the uh, vaccines don't work, and nobody knows what's in them, that they actually have caused uh, other people to die for different reasons uh, because they took a vaccine. Uh, how, how do you two respond when you, when you get, have to deal with some of that? As far as in my department, um, just, you know, I, I have to give the, the evidence-based um, mm. information and what I have and the statistics that I see, you know, I have to give them that as far as um, just educating them on vaccines. Mm, Dr. Ver? Um, I really... I mean, you know, in in the spirit of being completely transparent, yes, people, virtually any compound that comes out from uh, a pharmaceutical company um, is going to have a limited number of individuals that may be allergic to that particular compound. I will say, though, that, you know, we have given over 250 million doses of vaccine and in this country and the rate of death from that are related strictly to the vaccine is in the in the very low thousands. Now, by comparison, if you were to give two hundred and fifty million people in America penicillin without regard to, you know, because we don't know their allergy status before we give the vaccine. So there's no way to predict. But if you were to give 250 million people penicillin, I, I assure you the uh, death rate from allergy to penicillin would be much, much higher. So the vaccines really are exceeding the state. Uh, you're going to get you're going to get a sore arm. You're going to get a little bit of low grade fever. Maybe you're not going to feel like yourself for a day or two. But um, but the benefits so far outweigh the risk that uh, I just can't stress that. Uh, these things have been wonderful in our fight against COVID-19 and have saved hundreds of thousands. And if uh, some people are still disbelievers or uh, let's take that a little further, even conspiracy theorists, uh, uh, they're going to believe what they want to believe. But uh, so far, the numbers seem to speak for themselves. Yes, sir. I believe they do. Okay. Now, um, We've seen this thing uh, go from this huge uh, uh, public response, uh, you know, people showing up in the thousands and lining up, and uh, our own tribe had uh, a distribution point at the Expo Center, and uh, cars were lined up way out in the parking lot of people wanting to come in and get the uh, uh, um, vaccines. Now, can you? Uh, can you two let me uh, uh, let me know what kind of uh, response we have going on right now? I mean, are we having to uh, work our poor uh, uh, nursing staffs and doctors to the to the point of absolute fatigue? I mean, has it led up? Uh, have we added uh, personnel and, and uh, medicines now that uh, have made a real dent in this uh, in this challenge? As far as the vaccines, uh, we are not currently having any mass vaccination um, sites. So we do have these vaccines at all of our clinics and uh, all a patient needs to do is call that particular clinic and uh, schedule a time to go in and get, get the vaccine. <clears throat> One thing I might add to that is uh, this 
Next month, October starts our influenza vaccination uh, events. And the COVID vaccine can be given with the influenza vaccine. So if a, if a person wants to schedule a, a two for one visit, then they can get the booster and the influenza vaccination at the same visit. Are there any, uh, let's call them uh, problems or even dangers in taking the two at the same time? It's uh, recommended that they be given uh, together. So, you know, other than the, the sore arm, um, maybe body aches, then uh, that, would, that would be a um, localized type reaction. Uh, Dr. Varka, are you and your crew now prepared for any uh, major public response or demand for, uh, for uh, the boosters or any new uh, vaccines that might be coming out? Yes, sir, Gary. We, uh, we meet regularly on this. Uh, the vaccine, uh, the boosters, uh, have been uh, just recently released, but we have uh, ordered a uh, supply of those and more are on the way. Uh, we do have staff to be able to uh, administer the vaccines, and they are available at our, all of our clinics. Um, so I, I think we're well prepared. Uh, I, I will add to what Andy says. Uh, I'm a big believer in two-for-ones uh, when it comes to vaccines, and I think we need to keep in mind that influenza uh, kills about 35 to 50,000 people every year in the United States. So it is not a trivial illness either and uh, can have some pretty serious consequences. So I uh, I can assure you when, uh, I have to wait a little bit since I've already had COVID, but uh, when my when my uh, time is up and I'm eligible, I'm, I will be a two for one. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Sound like my wife and I will probably be in that line somewhere. <laughs> well, uh, good for you. Uh, the, uh, I'm glad you all mentioned flu. I mean, uh, that's something we've had to live with for seemingly forever. And the COVID is just another one of those uh, challenges that will be with us seemingly forever. So is that kind of the way people should be addressing uh, their response and, and their uh, demand for uh, vaccines? Well, as far as COVID, you know, it's still considered, we're still considered in a pandemic. However, we are slowly moving to the endemic, um, which means, you know, it's, it's in an area um, just like influenza. We know in October to March, influenza uh, rears its ugly head. So right now, COVID is is we're moving towards the endemic uh, portion of this disease, and we just will have to prepare and and manage the um, type and the months that maybe COVID appears. Uh, let me ask you all about booster shots. Uh, um, it's, uh, we've heard some talk uh, about how you might have to get a much uh, uh, on what amounts to a regular basis uh, every few months or something like that. Uh, explain the situation as far as uh, boosters are concerned. As far as the boosters, right now, uh, anyone that is five years and older who's completed the primary uh, vaccination series of two are recommended to get a booster. Uh, there is a third and fourth dose for the immunocompromised. And just like Dr. Vark said, this uh, additional uh, booster called the bivalent uh, booster uh, has just been delivered to our uh, Department of Health and we will start administering that type of booster. As far as the booster schedules, it's, it's somewhat complicated and I would encourage anyone that is, is wondering what, you know, if, if they are uh, in need of a booster 
to talk to their primary physician or one of the nurses at the clinic. Uh, they can go on our uh, Creek Health website and we do have information on when you can get a booster. Uh, my wife and I had uh, booster shots, uh, I guess, mm, seems like late summer, early fall of, uh, of last year. Uh, we are, are we in a position where we probably should be thinking about another one? Yes, I would encourage you or anyone like that to check with your provider so they can see uh, when your last booster was and what type it was. Mm -hmm. Now, is this treatment available at all of the clinics? I mean, uh, I usually go to Sepulpa for help that, that I might need or scheduled for. Uh, would this be available there, or would I have to come here to it? Yeah. It's in every uh, clinic that we have, uh, Sepulpa included. Okay, great. Um, what about the uh, wear and tear on your people? Uh, uh, we heard of uh, uh, situations where uh, medical staff were just absolutely wiped out with fatigue and of course some of them had contracted the virus and other things like that but uh, mental fatigue from having to deal with it all the time and uh, being away from families and things um, and I understand there were people who uh, just quit the profession because they were just burned out uh, what kind of situation now is uh, our tribal uh, Department of Health in as far as responders? As far as, as the, you know, from employee health standpoint, uh, we continue to provide employee health nurses a call system to our employees. Uh, if they're symptomatic, they can call in. Um, you know, during the height of, of COVID, especially with the Delta and when we had to deal with our ERs, uh, our floors full, yes, you know, the mental um, exhaustion was there for our, our staff. Uh, we do have our behavioral health um, people that, that provided um, you know, behavioral health services, uh, maybe counseling or workshops to to the staff. Um, <clears throat> as far as as the providers, I'll let kind of Dr. Vark speak to um, the the providers situation. Well, I uh, thank you, Andy. I I will say I I'm I'm glad to be able to say uh, that I. I want to put in a word for our staff and providers uh, at the Department of Health. Uh, I just think that they have done an outstanding job through this um, marathon of COVID for the last two and a half years. They, uh, they were tired, they were overworked, they were stressed, uh, but they showed up for work and uh, patient care was always premier on their mind. And I just think they've done an outstanding job of uh, uh, bearing up to the challenge and uh, and facing this, and they have they have helped just thousands and thousands of people uh, get through this pandemic. So um, I'm very proud of them, and uh, I I think that uh, if you if you see a hospital worker down the street, tell them that you appreciate their service because they have really put out for the last couple of years and. Uh, and they deserve that. Yeah, bless their they hearts. They do. Yes, bless their hearts. Now, the uh, situation uh, we uh, would hope uh, would have uh, gone to the point where now people who are interested in scheduling an appointment or something like that can fairly easily get it done. Uh, could you describe that situation? Is there still a waiting period that people might have to... Uh, have to deal with or are there walk-ins available uh, what do we have here as far as scheduling um, each each clinic has a system for administering the vaccines these vaccines 
are multiple doses, so we try to not have a lot of waste. However, you know, if, if someone's coming in, um, then, then they will administer the vaccine. But each person that uh, comes in, uh, we can administer right then. Okay, so um, walk-in is still still available. Yes, and that that is uh, each individual clinic has their own uh, mm, right. schedule. So I would encourage anyone to call and talk to their particular clinic. All right, well, let me uh, switch gears here now. Um, if one is... Uh, interested in of course the COVID now it's it's there it's available you can get in you can get treated and dealt with now we're hearing um, discussions and, and news uh, pieces on on this new and this this monkeypox and uh, it uh, uh, has caught a lot of people off guard and in, in, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, people don't know what it is, and of course people are going to make fun of its name uh, and this sort of thing. Do you have to be a monkey to get it? Blah, blah, blah. And some kind of ridiculous uh, responses to it. But uh, perhaps we could take a minute or two and, and, and find out a little bit more. Now, first of all, I guess, what is monkeypox? So monkeypox is a virus it's in the family of viruses of smallpox um, it originated or it's actually endemic to the central and west african countries um, our first case in the united states uh, appeared in may of this year uh, now it's in all 50 states in in the United States and as of September 6 there was over 20,000 cases oh, in uh, the United States so we uh, have a system at the Department of Health where if anyone uh, comes in maybe they've been exposed they know that they've been exposed or maybe um, they're showing symptoms <clears throat> of monkeypox then then we'll do a, a workup and um, work with the uh, Oklahoma State Department of Health as far as what types of tests or uh, contact tracing that we need to do with this particular virus now, perhaps you could, uh, one of you could describe the symptoms that uh, people might be kind of watching out for. The symptoms uh, that, that we know about are the fever, headache, muscle aches, swollen lymph nodes, uh, maybe chills, exhaustion. And then after a few days, a rash will appear that um, usually... Um, starts on the face and then the body. So um, anyone that um, has a rash of unknown um, source, then we would, you know, focus in and do uh, maybe a history on that particular person. Have mm -hmm. they traveled? Um, have they had close contact with someone that uh, maybe had um, this particular virus? Mm -hmm. Is this one of them that could uh, potentially be fatal? The, the, um, the monkeypox is, is a less severe uh, virus uh, than smallpox, and usually people recover from this virus. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Vark, have you and your crew seen any uh, uh, people uh, suffering with this particular virus? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I think Omni did a great job of describing the virus, but um, you know, like all of these issues in healthcare, I think uh, a little context is important. Now, she she's perfectly accurate that there are uh, twenty thousand cases, give or take, in the United States. But I believe, as of last week, in the state of Oklahoma, I think we had eighteen cases. So. You know, you have these high high density population areas like New York and California, 
that tend to they really the numbers go up but in terms of you know uh effects on on our local citizenry um the the effects of monkeypox have been really minimally felt um it is it's a it's a very uncomfortable disease. The rash and the blistering of the skin uh, can be quite painful. Uh, I, you know, in the, I have not seen a case personally, and I, I, I don't believe my crew has seen a case. But um, if you had a really nasty case of chickenpox, that gives you some idea of what the rash can look like and how it can feel, and it can take longer than chicken it takes up to four weeks for this rash to clear so and and the rash itself the blister fluid and stuff is uh contagious so uh if you get it um you're looking at a a fairly long period of recovery there are some uh some vaccinations that also help to shorten the course of the disease and those are available to the state department of health and we are getting a limited number of those uh, at the Department of Health, but, um, and I, you know, I, um, I don't know, maybe I should put a disclaimer to this next thing. I don't want to offend anyone in the audience, but, you know, there are, there are individuals that fall into high risk categories, um, with regard to this illness. And so far, um, the people at highest risk of contracting monkeypox um, are are men who have sex with men. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I uh, but um, you know, good good hand hygiene. Um, I don't know, Andy. I think you pretty much have to have contact with the body fluid to uh, to yeah. stand a good chance of catching monkeypox. Yeah, this virus is a skin-to-skin -skin contact or maybe a clothing that that a person with a rash has worn so any linens bed uh, bed linens uh, that would be a source of transmission and then of course the intimate contact right you're right well you understand that uh, particular sources of popped up in, in, in several different instances with different di viruses, so uh, if we can do a, a public health uh, assistance here or informational, then so be it, that's all right. And if it's uncomfortable for some people, then that's, you know, that's the way it is, but uh, we want to kind of steer them in the right directions and what to look out for. Uh, listen, I think we probably uh, could wrap this up now. Um, in, uh, in dealing with uh, looking at both of these particular subjects, uh, are there any kind of last words that uh, either of you would care to share? Just a reminder, the uh, flu mobile right. will be going out in um, October, so be looking for a flyer on the dates that the public health nurses will be out administering the influenza vaccines. Uh, we will start it with our employees the last week in September, early October. So um, get your flu vaccine. Right. Dr. Burke? Um, long area, I would say um, everybody needs to get your flu shot. And I recommend that you get boosted. Um, you know, the Department of Health will be will be monitoring this uh, into the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, we're <clears throat> we're getting we're getting more information every day. We are uh, increasing our ability, I think, to uh, combat this illness, uh, particularly COVID nineteen. And so, we will keep the public informed. Um, but everybody just follow your basic, uh, hygiene and mitigation strategies, as Andy has said, a little bit of social distancing, wash your hands, um, and 
Mm-hmm. Call us if you need anything. If you feel bad, we'll we'll take care of you. Okay, so we're not done with it yet, and we still have to deal with it. All right, well, oh, yeah. Dr. Vark, uh, uh, Ms. Peters, thank you so much for making uh, time and your schedules, and we appreciate you coming in. And, thank you, Gary. Uh, we'll uh, keep our eye on it, of course, and as uh, things uh, move along, we'll, we could be calling on you all again. So, but oh. Thank you. You're very well. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a short pause here, and then we're going to be talking about we have uh, the Diabetes Summit coming up, and we'll uh, get the uh, basic information on that and pass it on to you here. So please stay with us here on uh, Muskogee Radio on, uh, on, on The Brew. I started doing it when I was 11. I wanted to be just like my big brother. And some of my friends were already doing it. We got hooked fast. I just can't get enough. I'm Jacob, and I'm addicted to playing the drums. There's lots of stuff that makes it cool to be native. Doing meth isn't one of them. Find something better to do. Check out NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Who am I? Am I Indian? Just because I'm a girl from the res, Don't make things up about me. What if I move away? Then who am I? Some kids try meth just to escape. But then I think about my grandma, my little brother, my beadwork, my poetry. And I think, I like who I am. And I know meth is not for me. Check out NCAI.org, a message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Welcome back to uh, Muskogee Radio here on The Brew. We have uh, Tori Seymour uh, joining us now. Uh, I know we've talked about this particular subject in the past, but it's darn well worth repeating. So um, uh, we're here to uh, give you some reminders and some updates on the Diabetes Summit coming up very quickly, I understand. Uh, um, now, first of all, uh, Ms. Ms. Seymour, uh, g- uh, give us your title and, and your mission. Yes, welcome. Uh, my name is Tori Seymour. I am the diabetes dietitian at the Kuwita <coughs> Clinic, and I am the nutrition lead for the um, summit this year. And this is our 16th annual Diabetes Awareness Summit that will be next week, Tuesday the 20th, at the Glenpool Conference Center. So we're wanting to welcome everybody to the conference this year. It's our first in person since 2019. So we're excited to get to see everybody in person this year. Well, that is a, a good a good location also. Right yes. Off, <coughs> excuse me, right off of 75. <coughs> now, I, with... Uh, past uh, summits they've had quite a varied uh, uh, program to offer uh, so let's uh, let's get an idea of what you've got for us this year yeah so we have um, two keynote speakers we have Jason Champagne the native shelf chef LLC mm-hmm. he's going to be doing a presentation on the healing power of food and he's actually going to be giving out samples of what he's going to demonstrate so everybody will get to have a little taste a little sample of what he's making now we spoke with him uh, what, last, last week, week. yeah yes. mm-hmm. yeah and uh, got some really great ideas about uh, what you can do now he did not mention samples yes uh, however uh, now that you've let the cat out of the bag I presume there are going to be other other interested people showing up to see what you got. Yes. Now, um, in um, putting together your agenda, of course, food uh, and uh, diet, your specialty, uh, figures so prominently. Um, so maybe you could take a second there and kind of give, give us a, a why uh, food and diet is so important. Yes, um, with Jason, Jason's menus, his presentations he usually does, he usually does try to incorporate in more color with fruits and vegetables within his uh, menus and his um, cooking that he's sampling. And that's kind of a theme we have throughout as well. Our other keynote is going to be um, Colonel Fry, and he's going to be talking about health and indigenous foods. And those indigenous foods, a lot of times, are going to be those fruits and vegetables, the things that we could grow or gather, and um, plant-based proteins, those kind of things. As well as one of our other breakout sessions is Dr. Shaw, who is working at the Council Oak location 
um, that is, you know, one of our recent sites that we added. And she is um, very much wants to talk to her patients about plant-based fruit foods, um, plant-based proteins, incorporating those in, which a lot of times we don't think of. A lot of times whenever we're meal planning, we're thinking of, okay, what's our meat? Hey, I probably need to add a vegetable onto that plate, right? Versus switching it to the other way of thinking of incorporating in more of those um, plant-based foods, fruits and vegetables, plant-based proteins first, and then maybe adding in some of those um, animal proteins as well. Well, we, uh, I think most people's thinking is just exactly a reverse of that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, what kind of roast we got or a burger even. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and it's it's not accurate or it's, not, it's cheating to say, well, my vegetable is a french fry. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, yeah. So I, I see that theme throughout of our speakers and then also what we're trying to incorporate in um, for what we have available as the samples with Jason's presentation, um, but then we'll also have healthier snack options available for the participants there because it is a diabetes awareness summit. We want to have those healthier snack options available throughout the conference and then we're also having lunch catered as well um, so we're going to make sure we have a well-balanced lunch provided mm -hmm. to all the participants too and that doesn't mean dough it can be really tasty and uh, tasty and colorful and yes very colorful yes that's one thing i think a lot of people are challenged by is like you know do i have to eat vegetables you know i hate broccoli or whatever it is. um is there, is there some way then perhaps you can deal with that? Uh, you mentioned snacks, which is, mm -hmm. I think, a downfall of too many of us that uh, instead of, you know, the, you know the, the sweet kind of treats that we might favor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's a good substitute? I know I occasionally will slip in some uh, uh, raw carrots or celery or something like that. Is this, it, that the kind of thing we're talking about? Yeah, for sure. Um, incorporating more fruits and vegetables as snacks is going to be a great way. A lot of times for that sweet treat, incorporating in a high fiber fruit option would be great to get some of that sweetness, um, but then also get a lot of those nutrients and that fiber from the fruit. So you're getting more bang for your buck of what you're getting out of that um, fruit versus say a candy bar or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that would be great. A lot of times doing like a carrot or a cucumber slice would be great instead of like a chip as a side with a sandwich. And that could be a great way to incorporate in some vegetables. And I always tell my patients, it doesn't have to be like a salad. If you don't like salad, you don't have to eat a salad, for example, to get those vegetables in. You can eat any other kind of non-starchy vegetable and trying different ways of cooking it too. So it can be raw, like the carrots or the celery. Um, you could also roast it, steam it, broil it, put it in a soup, put it in a sauce. You know, there can be a lot of different ways to incorporate those vegetables instead of it just being raw on the side of your plate. Right. Uh, I don't know why I do this. I have these kind of discussions just before lunch. Uh-huh, yes. I'm uh, really hungry when I get out of here. Now, um, let me ask you a question about, uh, about fruits. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my favorites would be like uh, uh, a pear or watermelon or strawberries, if you can get them. Um, is the sugar content something we have to be aware of? Do we have to moderate and be careful about how much we, uh, we eat? Yeah, so our um, starches, like our breads, our pastas, rices, our starchy vegetable, like corn, peas, potatoes, our fruit, and our milk. Those are all going to contain carbohydrates that's going to affect the blood sugar. Our fruit and our milk are going to naturally have those sugars in them. So straight out of the cow, the milk's going to have sugar containing carbohydrates. And then the same thing with the fruit. Straight off of the vine, it's going to have some of that natural sugars in it as well, which is going to affect the blood sugar. So it's more of looking at the portion size for those items. So for a piece of fruit, say an orange, a pear, an apple, a small piece is going to be about 15 grams or one serving. 
For the watermelon, it's gonna be about one and a fourth cups is gonna be a serving. And then strawberries is going to be about um, a half a cup serving. So it's just looking at the serving size of um, how much you're eating. If you eat half of a watermelon, of course that's going to affect your <laughs> blood sugar more. Um, so it's just looking at the amount and then spreading those servings out throughout the day as well. So you're not having all of that half of a watermelon all at one time, that's gonna spike the blood sugar up. But if you spread out smaller servings throughout the day your body can help bring that blood sugar down mm -hmm. how about if you eat a small watermelon a water a small <laughs> just small. the size of it yes yeah. so and you know it's within that one and a fourth um, cups is going to be one serving of that watermelon and so that would be a good serving for say a snack for a watermelon you know it seems like that would be kind of a natural as so many of our people are involved with agriculture and mm -hmm. you know Hannah is famous for its watermelons mm -hmm. and then you know you got Stillwell and you got uh, strawberries and then, of course everything else that you can get to go with it so is it kind of a challenge then to uh, stay away from too much of that or uh, are people making wise choices that you've seen? Uh, yeah, that's, how are we doing? That's why we encourage our patients to always come to your diabetes clinic that's at each of our different clinics. So each of our clinics has a diabetes program, has a dietitian at that program for you to come work with them and um, help with looking at what your food choices are to get it within that balance for your blood sugar control. So we encourage anybody to come in and talk to us to help them out on those portion sizes. But also um, we're doing activity through our event as well. So we have different gentle yoga, chair exercises. We're gonna be doing a morning walk. So that's gonna be important as well to help with blood sugar control <coughs> is to keep that activity up. and. We're we're going to be showing examples of that throughout the program as well for di different little activity breaks throughout and that's going to be key for blood sugar control as well okay let's take a second here and look at some of the logistics and like when and where and is there a cost involved uh, what, what do we got here yeah so it is a free event um, and it's open to our community Muskogee Creek Nation community um, and their families and it's going to start at 8.30 in the morning on the 20th is going to be registration. You'll check in, get your um, health screening sheet, and you can go in and get our health screenings. And for the health screenings, we're going to be doing um, our height, weight, BMI, body fat percentage, blood pressures. We're also going to do risk assessments for diabetes, um, stroke prevention, and then also suggesting different labs that you can get done with your provider depending on how your risk assessments look for that health screenings um, and then like I said we're going to be having some of those physical activity breaks healthy snacks are going to be available throughout the event as well as lunch provided um, we're going to have our um, second chief there for the hem and prayer and then welcome will be um, chief David Hill so he's going to be there as well as well as secretary Terry health Secretary of Health Terry so he's going to be there as well for the welcome so um, and prizes will be available as if you go through each of the different activities throughout the day you'll get a stamp and you can get that turned in for different prizes like a cooler a bento box um, some different act, um, a t-shirt some different prizes throughout the day as well so as you participate in the different activities you can win prizes and it's all free food's free so we encourage everybody to come out for this first one in person okay let me uh, ask you to recap in those uh, specifics so uh, the date is the september 20th that's correct next and tuesday location at the glenpool conference center glenpool conference center You're getting a lot of business up there glenpool it's free. Uh, any age restrictions or child care or any of that kind of thing? We don't have child care available, um, and it's no restrictions of age, no. Okay, and some people have to worry about security in events these days. Uh, I presume Light Horse will have a presence. Uh, do you um, have some uh, we have provisions for that? The Glen it's at the Glenpool Conference Center, and I know City Hall for Glenpool is there on site as well, so we will have... Um, our staff is all going to be there to help out throughout the event. So definitely reach out to any of our diabetes program staff that will be throughout the whole event for any questions that anybody has throughout the event. And I presume Glenville Police will be just a phone call away. Yes. 
Now, the uh, uh, challenge of dealing with diabetes has been growing over the past few years as more of our people have, uh, have, have contracted, I don't know what the, the phrase would be, uh, developed it, uh, devolved into. Uh, do you have uh, perhaps some feel for numbers? Uh, and I might have to ask you to speculate here a bit, and so I won't hold you to the to the absolute uh, iron bar there. But uh, how is it affecting our people? And, uh, do you do those kinds of counts or anything? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, our Native American population has a higher risk factors for diabetes. And so that's one of the main reasons why we want to do that health screening at the event. So that if you don't already have diabetes, you can get that risk assessment done at this event and see what your risk factors are. And um, a family history can also increase your risk factors as well. So if you know some of your family members do have diabetes right now, you're at higher risk as well. So we encourage you to come to the event and get that um, risk health assessment done as well. So that's kind of a screening and assessment. Uh, are we talking about any treatment there, or would you send them back to a clinic? Yeah, we would send them back to their clinic um, to meet with their provider to do additional tests, A1C check, cholesterol level checks, especially for the stroke prevention. And um, then, like I said, come meet with the diabetes program and the dietitians. We also have a diabetes prevention program at each of the clinics as well. And we are actually recruiting for participants then. So even if you don't um, have diabetes from those tests you do with your provider, we do have that prevention side of it as well. So we encourage you to still come and meet with us so that we can get you in that prevention program. Uh, in uh, the course of your work in dealing with patients and people who uh, may be in a situation, do you have kind of a capsule uh, suggestion or a program or agenda that people might want to be aware of and, and try to follow in their lives to, to deal with diabetes? And we've only got uh, about two minutes left. <laughs> sure. Um, so like I said, um, you know, in looking at your lifestyle changes, healthier food choices like the plant-based proteins, um, increasing your fruit and vegetable intake, that's always going to be great. Increasing your activity level like the activities we're going to be promoting at the event will be also be great. But everybody's individualized whenever they come and meet with me. So I look at where there are right now and see what we can do to make those changes for them. So it's always great to meet with your dietitian at your site to get that individualized care. But like I said, we also have that diabetes prevention program, which is a year long program that can be done either virtually or in person. So that's something else that you can do for that prevention piece. Um, does, how does exercise fit, fit into this? Exercise is going to be definitely be great for weight management that can reduce your risk as well as um, helping your body use insulin better for decreasing those blood sugars. Um, so that can be a long-term thing that you can do for your health to help with your, reducing your risk factors. No, we're not talking about, uh, you know, the hardcore workout. Uh, no, just no. walking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good, good. Yeah. That's... Uh, about all my old bones will take these days is a nice, you know, nice walk. Yes. And uh, something that, uh, you know, walk your dog, take a stroll around the park. Uh, exactly, Go yes. out in the pasture and get chased by a bull. <laughs> <laughs> it's recommended about 150 minutes per week. Um, so that would be 30 minutes, five days per week. And you can be broken up into five, ten-minute increments as well. But we also have our exercise program managers at each clinic that can work with our patients to put up, um, put together an individualized program for your exercise as well. All right. Now, I'm sure that the uh, summit's going to be chock full of information. Uh, tables set up. People can walk around and collect whatever they... Uh... Yes, we'll have vendors as well there. Mm -hmm. Okay. No fry bread? No fry bread this year, no. Mm -hmm. Darn it. <laughs> well, that's okay. It'll set you back, you know, a couple of months anyway. Well, as... Um, we're looking to help our people deal with this. Uh, we put a lot of stress on it, and we will continue. But uh, once again, in the last uh, minute or so, let's uh, run over the specifics, the logistics, as I call them. I know we've talked about them before, but I kind of like to leave this information 
in people's minds. So. Yes. So I want to invite everybody to our 16th Annual Diabetes Awareness Summit that's going to be on Tuesday, September 20th from 8.30 to 3 o'clock at the Glenpool Conference Center. And this is a free event to the public, so we encourage everybody to come out. Now, outside of the uh, summit, uh, if people were looking to get more information or perhaps some assistance, uh, how do they get in touch with your program? So reach out to your local clinic that you have a provider at that you go to and um, contact the diabetes program there and we'll be able to give you resources for diabetes education, diabetes prevention education, and then if you'd like to meet with a dietitian like myself individually, you can as well. Okay. Um, let me, I just got to ask you this. Are we doing better with it? I mean, are we still losing, uh, losing that fight or are people becoming, you know, diabetes aware and, and doing something about it you, and, and, and what you said yeah we're actually um grant funded through the special diabetes program for indians and we've seen through that program a improvement in diabetes numbers um with that so we are seeing an improvement through the resources that we're providing our community all right well thank you so much tori seymour and uh good luck i understand the event has become more popular over the past couple of years so we Wish you much more success. Thank you. You've been listening to Muskogee Radio. Join us again next week for more local, tribal, and community news and updates. Mid-up.